This is a Scream Queen production. Jen Carpenter. Today's episode is a bit of a change of pace. So way back a million years ago when Danny was still doing the podcast with me and we were silly enough to think that we could do a new episode every single week, um, we tried to do like one paranormal episode a month. So there's a lot more of those back at the beginning of the podcast. Haven't done one in quite a while because they're just, well, for one thing, we found pretty quickly that our true crime episodes were much more popular. Not as many people were listening to the paranormal stuff. And now that it's just me doing it by myself, it's a little bit weird to talk about, you know, ghost stories. Ghost stories are fun to talk about with other people. And it's just me by myself staring into the mirror over my vanity. So I I mean, I guess I have a co-host. I am my own co-host. Um, it, <laughs> it's just a little weird. So I don't really do the paranormal stuff anymore, but today we're gonna do it because as I've explained to you guys a few times, the super freaks on Patreon, that's one of the tiers, um, super freak, they get to choose the subject matter for an episode of the show. And super freak Melissa, who is also, full disclosure, my cousin, she requested that I do an episode on Michigan cryptids. So today, that's what we're going to talk about. The first Michigan cryptid we're going to talk about today is the Michigan Dogman, a canine-like creature with the body of a human that has been spotted once every 10 years since the late 1800s. But really, stories about the Michigan Dogman date all the way back to when the Odawa tribes lived along the Manistee River in the northwestern part of the Lower Peninsula. So if you're looking at Michigan like a mitten, the Manistee River meets Lake Michigan kind of on the upper outer side of the pinky finger, if that helps or makes any sense at all. Among the Odawa and the Chippewa and the other local tribes in the area, there were all kinds of stories and sightings of this half-man, half-dog creature. But as we all know, even from the watered-down version we were taught in school, when the colonizers rolled in, they didn't give a fuck about native legends or customs or lives. They just came in, took over, and sent the natives packing, ignoring all of the warnings and the stories and all of that. Therefore, the first official account of a dogman encounter is from 1887, when it happened to white men. Because, of course, everything that happened before that didn't count at all. So, 1887, Wexford County, Michigan. This is up north, as we like to call it, near the Manistee River. Uh, It's home to, Wexford County's home to a bunch of little villages, including Cadillac. That was the, the big one that I recognized. I've been to and stayed in Cadillac a few times. There were two lumberjacks. They were out doing lumberjack shit when they encountered a creature that they at first thought was a dog. Because they were assholes, they decided to chase the dog. And this, this dog, or what they thought was a dog, ran into a hollowed-out log to hide. The men, again, because they were assholes, grabbed sticks and started poking and howling at the creature. And then it howled back, a very undog-like, humanoid howl. The creature emerged from the log, stood up, and it became clear to the men immediately that this was not a dog. The creature was between seven and eight feet tall with the face of a canine, but the torso of a human. It stood on two legs and had bright yellow eyes. Now it was the lumberjacks turn to run. The story goes that they ran all the way back to camp, packed up their shit and left. 
good. That's what you get. Don't be poking dogs with sticks. What the fuck? Anyway, so the next recorded dogman encounter was exactly 10 years later in 1897. A farmer in Buckley, which is a small village in Wexford County, was found slumped over his plow, dead from a heart attack. There were dog tracks in the soil surrounding the plow. With the story of the lumberjack's encounter with the dogman still kind of fresh in everyone's minds and the fact that this happened exactly 10 years later, a supernatural element was assigned to the farmer's death by locals simply because there were dog tracks. So if there hadn't been those tracks, nobody would have thought anything of it. But um, people believed that the farmer had encountered the Michigan dogman and he was so terrified that he had a heart attack and died instantly. Locals began reporting seeing creatures that looked like human-slash-dog hybrids circling their houses at night, howling with human-like voices, as I think any of us would do. You know, they tried to convince themselves that these were just dreams, but these reports were pretty frequent in the area at the time. In 1917, a local sheriff happened upon an abandoned horse buggy in the road and what looked like wolf tracks surrounding it. The humans were nowhere to be found, but the four horses that had been pulling the buggy were lying dead on the side of the road, their eyes wide open. A veterinarian ruled they'd died of fright. So this too was assigned to a dogman attack, but like, would wolves scare horses? Wolves would scare horses enough, so it could have just been wolves, right? Uh, In 1937... Fisherman Robert Fortney was out fishing on a river in Paris, Michigan. Did you know we had a Paris in Michigan? We actually have two. The village of Paris near Big Rapids, so about an hour south of Wexford County, where all of our dogman sightings have been thus far. And then there's Paris Township, which is clear on the other side of the state, up in the thumb. So... We're talking about that village of Paris, the one by Big Rapids, because not only was there a dogman incident, but that Paris has its very own Eiffel Tower. Wee oui, wee. Oui. It's, <laughs> I've never seen it. I've never been there, but it's only about 20 feet tall. But still, I mean, that's something, right? So this Robert Fortney guy, he's out fishing. A pack of wild dogs emerges from the woods and they start to charge at him. He fires a warning shot with his shotgun, and the dogs retreat. Except for one, the largest dog of the pack, who had dark fur and bright blue eyes, stood up on its hind legs and took on a more human form. It stared Fortney down until he fired his gun again, and then it ran back into the woods. Now, you guys know me by now. We've been doing this for three and a half years. If you don't know me, what are we even doing here? Um, I'm skeptical, number one. And I want facts, number two. Not just some like campfire fodder, which is why I don't do a lot of paranormal episodes. But anytime I do, I try to find any information I can to prove or disprove any element of the story. You know, to, to it's valid, it's not valid, these people were real. If they're real, there should be some record of them, right? Um, and while I didn't find anything about the dog attack, I did find some old news articles about a Robert Fortney from Paris, Michigan in the 1930s. He was actually the superintendent of some trout fishing association. So this was a real guy. What happened to him out in those woods? He's the only one that knew that. And that's how most of these dogman stories go. One or two people alone in the woods or on a desolate country road. When the Michigan dogman emerges from the forest, the creature is said to be very agile. It will jump in front of a person's vehicle or onto their path. It'll scratch up their car, their tent, their house basically just scare the shit out of them and in some cases scare them to death, literally, and then it takes off. And this only happens once every 10 years since 1887, so on years ending in sevens. That part's pretty fucking weird. In 1957, Reverend Patrick Stevens of a Methodist church up north found deep gouges in the church's exterior doors one day, like claw marks. That reminds me of that movie, The Village. You remember that? That M. Night Shyamalan movie? Anyway, the police chalked it up. They said it was a stray dog, but Reverend Stevens was like, uh, I think the fuck not. 
that dog would have had to have been over seven feet tall to make claw marks that high. In 1967, a van full of hippies partying overnight at a northern Michigan beach reported an odd incident to a park ranger. They said they awoke in the middle of the night to the sound of scratching on the van's windows, and outside they saw the Michigan dog man staring back at them and smiling. In 1987, a hundred years after the first Michigan Dogman attack, a Traverse City DJ by the name of Steve Cook released a song about the Michigan Dogman called The Legend. It was supposed to be an April Fool's joke. Um, I'm going to post the video on the SoDead website. So this kind of blew up slash backfired on him because it wasn't a joke for very long. Uh, the radio station became inundated with calls from people who wanted to share their own Michigan Dogman sightings. So it really became like a whole thing. And Cook released updated versions of his song in 1997 and 2007. So every 10 years, just like the Michigan Dogman sightings. Reports of Dogman sightings still occur today. In one recent incident, a driver called OnStar in the middle of the night following an accident in which they rolled their car. The caller told the OnStar representative, something just ran in front of us on the road. It looked like a great big dog um, standing up. I'm curious, though. What do you guys think? Is the Michigan dog man real? Have you ever had an encounter with this particular cryptid? And more importantly, why... Are we calling it the Michigan Dogman instead of just a fucking werewolf, right? Like it sounds like a werewolf to me. Or, you know what I was picturing? Honestly, I was picturing a kangaroo. <laughs> it's like kangaroos have that like man body. They stand on their hind legs. I guess in the dark, their face could look kind of doggish, right? Because they've got that long nose. Yeah, maybe we've just got fucking kangaroos up north. Who knows? Next up, we're going to Sagatuck Dunes State Park, still on Lake Michigan, so still on the west side of the state, but much further south. This one's actually almost a straight shot from Lansing to Lake Michigan. So if you get in your car, you're in Lansing, and you just drive due west until you hit the lake, Sagatuck is where you're going to end up. Sagatuck Dunes State Park has about two and a half miles of lakefront beach area, nature trails, And as the name suggests, sand dunes that people like to walk. I don't know why. It's fucking miserable. I tried it once. My legs about fell off of my body. Um, But they also like to ride up and down the dunes. That sounds like a little more fun to me. It also has a lot of dark history, though, including the legend of the Michigan melon heads. Which, why, why? Do all of our cryptids apparently need to have the word Michigan in front of them? Like the Michigan dog man, the Michigan melon heads, like we really just got to claim them, I guess. Anyway, according to local legend, the backwoods of Sagatuck are crawling with Michigan melon heads, small, feral, cannibalistic humanoids with bulbous heads. It is said that they were once patients at an asylum in the old felt mansion in Sagatuck, and that when the asylum shuttered its doors, these patients were released into the wild to fend for themselves. Today, they are said to stalk the perimeters of tourist traps, waiting to catch people alone so they can attack. They hide along dark roads at night, hoping for a car to break down or an accident to occur so that they can pounce. There have been many sightings of them in the area over the years. People often report a sense of unease or feeling like they're being watched when they're in the area. I do want to share with you guys one story I have. So I shared kind of a little blip about the melon heads on the Demented Mitten Tours page several years ago. Gosh, it's so weird that like things were several years ago. I've been doing this for that long now. Anyway, um, and one of the people that had actually been on a couple of our tours commented and shared a story about that area. So I want to share it with you guys. She said, I went to the beach one day out that way alone. And to get there, there's some winding paths through the woods. Wanting to watch the sunset, I stayed on the beach till almost nightfall. As I headed back... It was complete darkness out. Well, I took the wrong path on the way back to my car, and of course, there was no cell phone reception out there. Good to know if anyone is planning on going out and checking out the area. 
I ended up walking for what felt like an hour in total darkness through the woods on a path I could hardly see with no flashlight, except for the one on my phone, which did absolutely squat. Hi. I would have been crying so hard. I wonder if she was crying. She didn't share either way. Um, Oh, nope. I guess I should have just kept reading. I wasn't scared, though. Just tired. I would have been petrified. I finally saw some lights through the woods and thinking it was a house and knowing a house would lead to a road that I could navigate to get back to civilization, I cut through. I was nervous as hell thinking I was in someone's backyard, but at that point, I just wanted out of the woods. I made it through the clearing, and there's this huge mansion. It was gorgeous and serene with ambient lighting throughout. I hauled ass, though, thinking it was a private residence, and I made it to the road, which led to yet another long-ass walk to my vehicle. It wasn't until I got home that I came across an article about the mansion being haunted and the surrounding woods crawling with creatures. The whole experience was set up like the opening for a horror movie I had no idea I was in. Hmm. That's fucking terrifying. I mean, I'm I'm glad that, you know, she didn't experience the melon heads or anything, but that still sounds really scary. And it kind of reminds me of the worst road trip of my life. I'm going to take a little side detour here. Side detour? Just a detour, right? Like, I didn't need to say side, did I? Anyway. Uh, Back in 2011, I think, yeah, had to be, Uh, my husband was in Iraq that year and they came home in November, but he didn't get to come home home. He had to go back to Fort Hood. So I was going to drive from Michigan to Fort Hood to see him by myself. Okay. I like alone time, but that was a big thing for me. I'm not really a traveler. I definitely don't travel alone. And so that was a big deal. The first day of my trip went really well. Uh, I was staying with family in Tennessee overnight. So I made it, you know, Michigan to Tennessee, no problem. I wasn't feeling well by the time I got there. I think I might have had like some motion sickness and obviously some major anxiety going on, but I was just not feeling well uh, when I arrived. So I had kind of a rough night. But I got up the next morning, packed it back up, took off, saw the Mississippi River for the first time. So that was cool. And most of the day went well. And then I hit Texarkana, which is like Texas, Arkansas border, as you might suspect. So I was like, oh, I made it. I'm here. I did it. Well, before I had left, um, it was my aunt's house that I stayed at in Tennessee. Before I left my aunt's house to go to Texas, do the last leg of my journey. She had given me her GPS. She was worried about me. And she plugged in a route, you know, plugged in from address to address. So the route that I would have taken was a very standard route. Um, I would have kind of gone a little out of my way, but then traveled down a major highway from Texarkana to Fort Hood. This route that she gave me was the quickest route. It was terrifying. (laughs) It was So it just kind of cut right through Texas, like at a diagonal angle, which was the quickest route, but it took me through some of the most hills have eyes towns I've ever seen in my life. And I pee a lot. So like every couple hours, if I found a bathroom, I had to stop and pee, but there was tons of nothing. There were mountains. Does Texas have mountains or do they just call them hills? I don't really know. But it was like this mountainous, hilly, country, scary, isolated region. At one point I was driving and I was driving on this little like one lane bridge, long ass, one lane bridge over this swampy, mossy water. And I was like, Jesus, this looks like something out of true blood, right? Because again, I'm not well traveled at all at then or now, but especially not back then. And uh, then my car started picking up a Louisiana (laughs) radio station. So I was like on the Texas-Louisiana border, which I, you know, I wasn't going the wrong way, but it wasn't the common way to get from point A to point B. It was the quickest way. And there's a reason that that is not the common way because it's fucking treacherous. (laughs) And it was so scary. So I get to... 
a gas station. And at this point, you know, I was supposed to get to Texas that night, which I mean, I was, I was in Texas. I was supposed to get to my destination. I was staying with my friend, Allie. Hi, Allie. Um, at her apartment in Texas because the guys were going to be back the next day. And I was supposed to be there that night. I'm still three, four hours from Fort Hood, according to this GPS device, which is now losing its signal because there's no internet for hours at a time. I'm terrified. There's nothing, 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 right? And then finally, it's sun setting. It's six, seven, eight o'clock at night. It's November. So even though it was hot down in Texas, the sun still sets early because it's winter. So I'm down there. I find a gas station. I'm running out of gas also now at this point. So I've got no cell phone service, no gas, no clue where I'm going to get, how I'm going to get where I'm going to get. And that's nighttime. I'm crying. I'm panicking. I find a gas station. The inside is closed, but you can still do the pay at the pump. So at least I'm able to fill up my gas tank. And then I saw a Taco Bell sign. I don't even like Taco Bell that much, but I was so happy. So I go to this Taco Bell and it's almost like a little, like like a city, right? Most of the places I've seen since leaving Texarkana and, and heading on this route, like you would reach this four corner stop and it would be the gas station, the grocery store and the restaurant. And if you were not local, it was very clear that you were not really welcome there. So this was the first like normal thing I had seen all day was this Taco Bell. So I go inside, I get food. I also hadn't eaten in several, several hours. I go inside, I get some food, I get some caffeine. Sun is setting at this point. It's like, it's not darkness is coming soon. It's like the darkness is happening now as I'm at Taco Bell, but there's cell service. So I call my parents, I'm panicking because my husband can't help me. He's on a plane from Iraq back to America at this point. So he can't help me. Um, I call my parents, they get out a map and they find the city of Tyler, Texas. And all of these towns have populations of like a few hundred people. Tyler, Texas has a big population. It's a real city. And it's about an hour from where I'm at at this point. So I was like, I can make it there. I'm comfortable knowing that in an hour, I'll be in a big city with stores and people and hotels. And if I know that there's something like that close, I can do this for another hour. I'll be okay. So because there's just there's absolutely no chance at this point that I'm making it to Fort Hood that night. It's not happening. So I get back in my car. I drive to Tyler. I find a motel. I think it was even a Motel 6 or a Super 8. I'm not sure. I don't care. I did not care at that point. I found what looked like a good little area. It's pitch black out. I got a room. The light outside my room was flickering and it was a little dingy and it definitely it was reminiscent of a horror movie, but nothing like what I had just come from and passed through. So I check into my room. I get some more food because I'm a stress eater, right? I get snacks. I'm like, all right, we're good to go. We're going to chill out. I take a Xanax. We're going to get a good night's sleep. Tomorrow, it'll be daylight. We'll talk to the people in the hotel about the best way to get from here to Fort Hood without driving back through any more deliverance country. And um, then, of course, I get on my social media to relay my whole ordeal about how relieved I am to have made it to Tyler, Texas. And people start commenting and they're like, you know that that's like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre City, right? Bro. It's, it is, it's not. Like, I think the movie was set-ish there or filmed-ish there. Some people said Tyler. Some people said Round Rock, which was right nearby. But this is where I was. And this was supposed to be this scary backwoods town where Texas Chainsaw Massacre took place. And it was like, to me, it felt like a safe haven compared to where I had just been. So that's how bad where I had just been was. And that's what all these stories about the melon heads remind me of. Like, you, you're you in the woods and you're scared and you see this house and you're like, yes, go to the house. And then the house is this fucking haunted former asylum full of um, cannibalistic melon heads. So anyway, that was a really long side story. I'm sorry. I just had to share that story. Yeah, it was, 
<laughs> something. And this, her story about getting lost in the woods around the felt mansion just kind of reminded me of that. All of this to say that the felt mansion where the melon heads supposedly are was never really an asylum at all. It is, though, a 12,000 square foot mansion that is said to have some ghosts of its own. It was built in 1928 by millionaire inventor Dor E. Felt as a summer home for his wife, Agnes. Just about six weeks after they moved in, Agnes passed away and she was actually never able to enjoy her vacation home. So paranormal investigators believe that that is why she haunts her bedroom in the Felt Mansion to this day. Visitors have reported becoming locked in that room. They hear the voice of an elderly woman. They see her shadow pass by the French doors that head out to the sunroom. So there, there are rumors about it being haunted, but not by these melon heads necessarily. When Mr. Felt passed away a year and a half later, the family sold the mansion and it became the St. Augustine Seminary for Boys in 1949. Huh. I bet you some shit happened there. And then in the 1960s, it was a home for nuns. In the 1970s, it operated as a state police post and a correctional facility was built on the property. And then for years, it just kind of sat there abandoned Um, The legend about the melon heads roaming the grounds began. People spoke of, you know, the haunted ballroom, the ghost of Agnes Felt, and the strange goings-on at the property, which was just becoming run down and true horror movie stuff. But in the early 2000s, a restoration project began, and today the Felt estate is owned by the township. It's a stunning event venue that hosts weddings, reunions, corporate events, all kinds of stuff. They also offer private group tours of the estate when there's not events going on. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to see if they're still booking tours for this summer if you're going to be in the area at all. But remember, as you're admiring the beauty of the gardens and the classical revival architecture, to always be aware of your surroundings because you never know who's watching from the woods. All righty then. Last one. Let's talk about the Nain Rouge, Detroit's most feared mythical creature, said to foretell tragedy in the Motor City. Also known as the Red Dwarf and the Devil of Detroit, the Nain Rouge's story dates all the way back to the founding of Michigan's largest city. The Nain Rouge is described as a dwarf with a red face, glistening red eyes, and a permanent grin that reveals a mouth full of sharp, pointed teeth. Now, Detroit was founded by a real-life monster by the name of Antoine de la Moth Cadillac. Yes, like the car, that's why they were given that name, in 1701. If you don't know anything about this guy, look him up, or mayhaps I'll do an episode on him one day. Legend has it that in 1701, a party was held in his honor. One of the attendees at this party was an elderly fortune teller, described as a woman of unusual height, with a dark, swarthy complexion, glittering eyes, and strangely fashioned garments. I want glittering eyes. She also had a cat on her shoulder, so I'm sure she made quite an impression. This woman starts telling the guests their fortunes, and she saves Cadillac, who is hella skeptical, for last. She tells him that he will found a great city and have many children. Both of those things happened. Um, But also, she tells him that his colony would be the scene of strife and bloodshed, also true, and that he needed to appease the Nain Rouge, the demon of the strait. She told him that the Nain Rouge was... Most malignant if offended, but capable of being appeased by flattery. So basically, he's here to fuck shit up, but if you kiss his ass, he might go easy on you. Cadillac ignores this. He doesn't believe in red devils that can wreak havoc on the city he's building. So he just kind of goes on about his treachery and fuckery of his own. Six years go by, Detroit is up and coming, and then one day, Cadillac comes face to face with the Nain Rouge. And he does what most of us would probably do if faced with an angry red dwarf with monster teeth. He hits the thing with his cane, right? (laughs) Like, get away from me. So he hits it with his cane. 
thus enacting a curse on not only himself and his family, but the entire city of Detroit, which that hardly seems fair to me, but okay. Uh, Ever since, the Nain Rouge has been a harbinger of doom in Detroit, popping up just before disaster strikes. There are two very different outlooks on the Nain Rouge. There are those who believe he causes the disasters that his appearances are connected to, and those who believe that he is actually trying to warn the residents of the city he loves of impending doom. Either way, here are some of the tragedies in Detroit during which the Nain Rouge has been spotted. He was spotted on July 30th, 1763, scampering along the shore of a creek where the Battle of Bloody Run would occur just hours later. The battle was part of Pontiac's War, which was kind of a last-ditch effort by Native tribes to take their land back from the colonizers. Chief Pontiac and his troops laid siege to Fort Detroit in an attempt to reclaim it, and so on July 30th, 1963, about... no. No, no, not 1963. (laughs) Wouldn't that be wild? Like our parents would remember that shit. Um, July 30th, 1763, about 250 British soldiers launched a surprise attack in an attempt to break up this siege on Fort Detroit. But Chief Pontiac had been alerted to the British forces plan. And so he and his troops were ready and waiting They attacked first, 20 British soldiers were killed, and 34 more were wounded in this failed attack that was so brutal, the creek ran red with blood, and the Nain Rouge was seen dancing among the corpses when the battle was over. 1963. (laughs) The Detroit Devil was spotted again just before the Great Fire of 1805 that burned the entire city of Detroit to the ground. On June 11th, a fire broke out near the stables of John Harvey, a local baker. It's believed that hot ashes from a pipe sparked a fire at his barn, which then spread to other structures nearby. The population of Detroit was only about 600 people at that time, so there's no fire department, no fire truck. Um, The residents actually formed a bucket brigade and tried to put the fire out on their own, and they didn't. No, they weren't successful. Uh, Nobody died in the fire somehow, thankfully, but the whole city went up in flames. All that was left behind was an old British fort and then like the chimneys, like the brick chimneys of some of the structures. So the wooden structures burned to the ground, but the brick chimneys remained standing. The Nain Rouge was said to have been dancing all up and down the streets of Detroit during the War of 1812, when the U.S. surrendered Fort Detroit to British forces. This was the only time in history that an American city has ever surrendered to a foreign country during war, and it happened without any fight at all. Uh, When General William Hull, who was in charge at Fort Detroit, saw the sheer number of British and Native American forces gathering outside the fort's walls, he surrendered immediately making Detroit a British territory once again, until it was recaptured by Americans about a year later. For his cowardice, General Hull was sentenced to death, but President James Madison overturned the death penalty in his case. Another big event the Nain Rouge popped up for was the Detroit Rebellion of 1967. Two utility workers claimed to have seen him just hours before a bloody battle broke out between Detroit's black community and the Detroit Police Department in the early morning hours of July 23rd, 1967. This one really did happen in the 1960s. Uh, It began when the Detroit Police Department raided an unlicensed weekend drinking club known as a blind pig. They were expecting to arrest maybe a handful of people, but they found 82 people inside. Um, so, you know, they they arrived ready to take five or six people with them, and instead they had 82 people that they were trying to arrest. So a quiet trip down to the station to railroad a group of people that, by the way, were celebrating the return of two American soldiers from the Vietnam War. That's what they were doing. They were having a party, and they got arrested for having a party. There were so many of them that, you know, police had to line them up in the street and arrange for additional transportation. And as this was all going on, a crowd of angry onlookers gathered like, what the hell are you doing? They were just having a party. These guys just got back from Vietnam. Fuck you. Go away. 
Tensions escalated. Things eventually turned violent. The rebellion, which was the largest in American history in over a century, lasted for five days and resulted in over 400 buildings being destroyed, over 1,000 people injured, and 43 people killed, including four-year-old Tanya Blanding, who was huddled in the living room of her second-story apartment with her family when a member of that family stepped out onto the deck to smoke a cigarette. Military troops had been called in by this point, and National Guardsmen mistook the light from the cigarette for a weapon, and they opened fire on the apartment with rifles and their tank's 50 caliber machine gun. Seriously, what the fuck? And little Tanya was killed in this incident. So these are just a few of Detroit's major tragedies that the Nain Rouge has made an appearance for. The question remains, though, is he using chaos magic to make these things happen, Or is he simply trying to warn residents of impending doom? He reminds me a lot, a lot, a lot of the Mothman. And everybody loves the Mothman, so why do we hate the Nain Rouge? Uh, Speaking of, I carry a book at Dead Time Stories now called The Lake Michigan Mothman. I have no time to read. Fun fact, if you own a bookstore, you don't have time to read anymore. But you should come get it. Somebody, you guys come Come buy it. Not all at once because I only keep a few copies at a time, but come get it. And the June bonus episode for patrons is going to be about the Mothman, which I'm super excited about because the Mothman and the Fresno Nightcrawler are my two most favorite cryptids. But I digress. Back to the Nain Rouge. In 2009, an event called March de Nain Rouge began, during which Detroit residents march the Red Devil out of town and banish him for an entire year. But Nain's supporters also attend that festival. They try to spread what they believe is the true story of the Nain Rouge, and it leads to, I I guess, like some drama, some hostility here and there. And that's something I definitely have to see for myself one day, people fighting over the intentions of a Red Devil. (laughs) Anyway, the festival is typically held in late March, and it draws in crowds into the tens of thousands. Because of COVID, it obviously had to be canceled in 2020 and 2021, which means that the city of Detroit has been unprotected from the Nain Rouge for over a year now, and they've still got several months to go before they can do their march again. Hang in there, guys. That is all I've got for you today on the topic of Michigan cryptids. This one was actually a lot of fun to do. If you have stories about the Michigan Dogman, the Michigan Melonheads, or the Nain Rouge, I would love to hear them. You can email me, message me, whatever. Now, let's get into a little liquid cheese. Today, I'm going to tell you guys about a time I witnessed a crime, like a a real, like a legit crime, not someone shoplifting scrunchies from the Disney store, which... I also saw once because it was my friend that did it. Typically, you know, the main episode of So Dead is going to be really heavy, so the liquid cheese is something light and fun, but today is going to be the opposite. This episode was overall a fun one. Well, it was fun for me. I don't know if it was fun for you, but it was fun for me. And um, this story is not going to be that at all. So this happened back in 2015, I was working for the state. Our office was located uh, in Lansing on the south side on the corner of Jolly and Cedar. If you're familiar, it was like the old Secretary of State building a million years ago. I was on my way to work that morning. And let me just tell you, this intersection is a very dangerous intersection. I have had two vehicles actually totaled at that intersection in the morning on my way to work. The first one was because the asshole in front of me did not have working brake lights. It was super early in the morning. My brain was not firing on all cylinders, and it just took me way too long to realize that they had come to a stop so that they could turn into my work's parking lot because there was no brake lights. And so I was way too close to them by the time I realized they were actually stopped. And I did hit them, but it wasn't my fault. Says the police, not just me, says the police. Totaled my vehicle airbags went off. And let me tell you, those things fucking hurt bad. You would think they'd be like soft and pillowy. No, 
that was the only part of me that really hurt was my face because it hit me so hard. Anyway, that was the first time. Second time, five, six years later, I was sitting at the light, getting ready to turn. My light turned green. Thank God I crept out into the intersection instead of like gunning it. Because if I had been maybe a foot further into the intersection when this fucking bitch lawyer who was on her phone and not paying attention to one of the most dangerous intersections in the city came flying through a red light, if I would have been any further into the intersection, she would have hit me directly and we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Instead, she just ripped off the entire front of my minivan and um, yeah, that was that was super fun. So all, all of that, just to, to reiterate, that it's a pretty dangerous intersection. So I'm on my way to work this morning, and there's a lot going on. There's, like, fire trucks parked along the sides of the streets and stuff. And then I realized that it's they do this fundraiser, they did, this fundraiser every year for the Muscular Dystrophy Association called Fill the Boot, where the fire department would be, like, at the busy intersections in the city, and they would um, have boots, like, their boots, And when the light would turn red, they would walk out into the intersection, walk up and down the cars. People would roll down their windows and throw money into the boots. That's what you were filling the boots with was money for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And this morning, it was September, so it's like early fall. I was sitting at the light and lights red and all of these firefighters come and just kind of like swarm the cars. And I thought to myself this is really dangerous and somebody's going to get hurt. I make it to work. I was getting out early that day because my son had an eye appointment. Um, My husband was meeting me at the eye doctor with him. So I got out about three o'clock and I had to pass back through that same intersection. And the firefighters, bless them, they're still out there all day long. They've been out there collecting money. And I see what looks like kind of an altercation. I see a firefighter walk up to this pickup truck and it looks like the men are arguing, but I can't really tell. It looks like they're yelling and I'm thinking like, are they just yelling because they can't hear each other over the cars? But they, I mean, they look like they're yelling. And so my light turns green and I start to go. And as I'm going, I kind of glance over one more time and it looks like the guy from the truck throws something. And I'm like, what the hell? Whatever. This is the South Side. I'm used to seeing weird shit. So I just keep going. Um, I get to my son's appointment about 15 minutes later. And my husband is like, what the hell's going on over by your office? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, um, uh, a firefighter got hit by a car. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, I knew that was going to happen. But then I was like, also, I was just there. Like, I was just right there. So it happened in the time between me going through the intersection and me getting to this appointment 10, 15 minutes later, very small window. I had no idea how awful the story was going to turn out to be. So I'm not going to get super into it. You guys know that I don't like to do stories that are real recent um, and real local. And this one, of course, obviously feels personal to me because of how close it happened to me and because I kind of witnessed the start of it. But basically... The firefighter that had been hit was a 35-year-old man by the name of Dennis Roadman. He was an Iraq War veteran. He'd been with the fire department for seven years. He had just gotten married a few months earlier. He and his wife had recently purchased a house with like 26 acres out in Owasso. They were expecting their first baby together. So it's like beautiful, right? Like the start of their life. His wife? was actually a nurse at Sparrow Hospital, which that's where he was taken after he was hit. And she was on duty in the ER that day. So she was there when he arrived by ambulance and she was there with him when he died a short time later. The man who hit him was 22-year-old Grant Taylor. Um, This was a young man with a history of mental illness who did not run Roadman down by accident. He did it on purpose. Now, I should say that this man's mother had tried multiple times over the years to have him committed to mental health facilities. She got no help. She would call the police, no help. He was on and off his meds. You know, he's a grown man, so he gets to make his own decisions, but he was not making good ones. And he was really going downhill, and she knew that he was dangerous, and she reported that to police 
over and over and nothing was done about this. Um, and so the end result was just beyond horrific. Basically what happened was that he was pissed that the firefighters coming out into the street to collect this money was slowing down traffic. Um, so he started yelling at one of the firefighters that just happened to be Dennis Rodman. And that's what I saw. I saw the two of them at the beginning of their argument. He threw an apple core at him. So that was, I saw that as well. And then I drove away and Grant Taylor drove away as well. So he was on Cedar headed south. And so he passed through the intersection. He left, it was over. And then he turned around and came flying back through the intersection, aimed his car at one firefighter that was able to jump out of the way, and then hit Dennis Rodman, who was not able to jump out of the way. He, they took, obviously, they took him to the hospital. He died a short time later. Um, This man, like, they hunted him down through the neighborhoods. They found him. They got him. They arrested him. Um, You know, his trial took a long time due to the mental health stuff. He wound up pleading guilty but mentally ill to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to at least 30 years in prison. But that was just, I mean, it was a horrible, 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 horrible story. It was a big news story at the time. So if you're local, and even if you're not, you might remember it because it made national headlines. The funeral was a huge event. They held it at um, the Breslin Center, which is where MSU basketball plays, and they hold concerts. So this huge venue for the funeral because so many people came. There have been parades and memorials. There's part of a highway named after him now, and it happened like right in front of my office. The evidence of it happening, like the tickets, the MDA tickets, receipts were still just scattered across the road, like confetti stains in the road were still visible for days, and it all happened right outside my office, and I witnessed the very beginning of it, and it was fucking terrible. Yeah, so that's my horrible, sorry to bum you out at the end of what was kind of a fun episode. That's my horrible story about the time that I witnessed a crime. I want to hear yours. Tell me about a time that you witnessed a crime. Doesn't have to be a terrible one like that. They can be funny. We like funny, right? It can be someone trying to shoplift and, you know, whatever. Um, share, share your stories. So last thing. I mentioned earlier that this month's Patreon episode is about the Mothman. Um, It hasn't come out yet. I haven't done it yet. But I just want to tell you something about my patrons. They are wonderful, wonderful people with the patience of saints. Uh, With everything I've got going on right now, the bookshop, the expansion of the bookshop, the new book coming out, the whole editing process, the Festival of Oddities creeping closer... I have been slacking big time in the Patreon department. Um, I owe you guys, what, like three bonus episodes right now? April, May, and June. You'll get them all. I promise I'm working on them. I know exactly what they're all going to be about. I just, there's no time. There's never any time. That was my really bad (laughs) Jesse Spano impression. So I know that I typically do the monthly shout out for patrons via social media, But this month, I wanted to do it in the actual episode because I appreciate you all so much and your patience has been a great relief to me. It relieves some of that pressure. So I want to send the biggest thank you ever to the following people. Tasha Sarles. Also, also, I'm going to butcher all of your names, but you're used to that, right? Um, Tasha Sarles, Stephanie Whitledge, Jeannie Buck, Sarah Theobald, Lacey Johnson, Elena Burke, Brian Worley, Jean Sika, Audrey Carlson, Michael Scott, Debbie Doss, Melissa Adcock, Deborah Viegas, Holly Forbes Scribner, Brittany Starr Steele, Lori Martusi, The Lady of the Lore, Lisa Sexton, Paloma Brianna, Nicholas Drew, Christine Newton, Caitlin Zemla, Miranda Revere, Ann Alspa, Marina Escobar, Karen West Aiello, Jean Bookout, Rochelle Anthony, Alicia Hadley, Allie Bateman, Daria Loyo, Julie Villastrigo, Morgan Vermetti, Allison Mole, Jessica Hexum, Michelle Bassard, Erin Early, Brianna Richmond, Nicole Spica, Courtney Potter, Quinn Cervantes Prevo, Rebecca Barrett, Amanda Zimmerman, 
Kimberly Crapo, Jill Lavengood, Greg Rosenberry, B. Gray, Shelby Denstead, Elena Miller, Shannon Howard, Colin Anzacek, Amanda Morer, Shelly Gonzalez, Melissa Selleck, Holly Wheeler, Laura Carl, Tara Burninghand, Taylor Suzanne, Heather Hunsacker, Amber Santana, Luann Hun, Steph Bartlett, Sarah Cook, Bonnie Thurston, Cindy Wright, Monica Kehoe, Tina Ziegler, Melissa Doss, Denise Thomas, Jacob Bernard, Stephanie Black, Cy Wilson, Diana Chambers, Shelby Morley, Maggie Helwig, Darla Thomas, Misty Cook, Tracy Luce, Gay Mullen Brown, Sammy Joe Marsh, Mandy Westfall, Stephanie Bellflower, Haley Sellers, Sue Lewis, Heather LaFave, Nikki Fulton, and Tammy Austin. Are you guys still with me? Because I, I know that was a lot of names and I am so grateful that there are so many of you. Thank you all, patrons and non, for joining me today. A new episode is coming your way in a couple of weeks. Be sure to follow So Dead on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter if you're not already. And TikTok. I'm really big into TikTok right now, even though I'm too old for it. So on TikTok, you can find me under Scream Queen 517. Uh, Don't forget that the Screamatorium at Dead Time Stories Other Half is opening up very soon. At the time of this recording, I'm planning on July 1st, but like that's a Thursday. Is that dumb to open on a Thursday? I don't know. So July 1st-ish, that weekend somewhere in there. Uh, Be sure to keep an eye on the Dead Time Stories social media page for more information on the exact opening of the Screamatorium. And until then, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks. So